times do we fall on our knees and we say, Lord, forgive me for my sin. Lord, I ask that you would forgive me. And we feel as if we're not forgiven. This is a deception of Satan himself to allow us to dictate whether or not God can forgive us based on our feelings. Welcome to Amazing Discoveries. My name is Loami Richardson, Evangelist of Salt Outreach. And what you are seeing, watching right now is part two of our presentation entitled, The Struggle is Real. In our previous presentation, we were discussing the importance of knowing our need for Jesus. And we was looking at the story of Nicodemus and the rich young ruler and how they correlate with the uh, last day church, the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter three, how both of these individuals were rich, increased with goods and felt no need of Jesus until Jesus showed them their condition and showed them that they were wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And then what we was able to see was their responses to that message. One, ultimately surrender his heart to Jesus, which is of vital importance and, un and, and helping us understand the love of Jesus in our hearts. And the other, loved his possessions more than he loved Jesus, and he walked away very sorrowful. But as we was presenting in our last presentation, we was talking about the, emphasis, the importance of the Holy Spirit. And how Jesus said in John chapter, th uh, John chapter 3 that we must be born of the Spirit. And so what we're going to be talking about today is the essential oil and understanding our need of the Holy Spirit. So before we begin, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, we just want to thank you again for the opportunity to be able to break bread together. And Lord, I just pray that your son may be uplifted, that all men, women, and children may be drawn unto him, that you may hide me behind the cross and dear Lord, that the words that I'm about to speak may be words from on high. We love you. We thank you for we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, let me tell you a little bit of my experience on essential oils. This has become a new phenomenon now, it seems like. And I remember I was in Hawaii and there was a group of friends of ours, majority females, and they was, they was telling me about an essential oil party that they were having. Well, I can tell you from a guy's perspective, I'm not much of an essential oil guy. If, if I have a headache, I take Tylenol. If I'm thirsty, I drink water, right? That, that's how we uh, deal with the symptoms that we have. But they kept raving about all of these benefits and, and, and we should come. And so uh, a group of my friends said, hey, we're going to go to this, um, <laughs> to this essential oil party. And I was like, sure, why not? Now, guys, you, I have to admit, I lost my man card that day because it was actually Game 7 of the World Series, and I skipped out on the World Series to go to this essential oil party thinking that there was going to be other guys there. And lo and behold, as I got there, I was the only dude there. And it was all of these females talking about the essential oil and the benefits and how it alleviates, uh, how you can use it for uh, mosquito repellent and, and stretch marks and how it soothes, uh, how they use it to calm their nerves and helps them study better. And I was there for two hours listening, of the most, uh, uh, listening to the benefits of the essential oil. But did you know that the Bible actually defines and describes an essential oil that you and I need? And what we're going to be doing is discussing the essential oil of the Holy Spirit. And it's found in Matthew chapter 25. If you have your Bibles, let's go to Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to read verses 1 through 12. In Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 1, we're going to take a look at a parable of the foolish virgins. And in uh, Matthew chapter 25, we have to keep this in mind that in Matthew 24, Jesus describes the signs that are going to take place out in the world before he comes. Matthew 25 focuses on the signs that will take place right before he comes within the church. And so in Matthew 25, keep in mind that God is talking to his church. And I want you to notice what he says in this parable in verse one, Matthew 25 and beginning in verse one, it says, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, five of them were wise and five were foolish. And those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and they slept. And at the midnight cry, was heard, behold, the bridegroom who is coming to go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. Notice what it says, the response in verse nine. But the wise answered saying, no, lest there shall be not enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in 
with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. And afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But Jesus responds in verse 12, and he answered and said, Surely I say to you, I do not know you. Verse 13, watch therefore, for you neither know the day or the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. And so we see that Jesus is illustrating the importance of the Holy Spirit in this parable of the ten virgins. Now we see that they're composed, it composes of ten virgins, five were foolish, five were wise. But what makes the foolish virgins foolish? is because the foolish virgins did not take the extra oil that was necessary, and the five that were wise were the ones who took extra oil. But you see, the problem with the foolish vir with the virgins, what, it wasn't that they, didn't, that, that they were awake during the time because they all fell asleep, but when it was time for them to awaken for the, for the bridegroom to come, we see that the wise virgins were the ones who had the essential oil to move forward in the parable. But I want you to notice what it states here. In Christ's Object Lesson, page 406, it says the two classes of watchers represents the two classes who, pre, who, who profess to be waiting for their Lord. So we're seeing that these two classes of virgins represents the two classes of individuals or two groups of people that will be living during the time right before Jesus comes. It says they are called virgins. Why? Because they profess a pure faith. By the lamps is represented by the what? By the word of God. So we see that at the end of time, right before Jesus comes, there are going to be two classes of people. There are going to be those who are wise and those who are foolish. They're called virgins because they profess to have a pure faith. And the lamps that is represented here in the parable is represented by the word of God. But I want you to notice what the oil represents. The oil is a symbol of the what? Of the Holy Spirit. In the parable, notice, all the ten virgins went out to meet the bridegroom. So the whole, we see that the five foolish and the five wise go to meet the bridegroom. So that's not the issue. All had lamps and vessels for oil. So they all had the word of God. They all had oil in their lamps. But notice, only five had neglected to fill their flask with oil. We're going to talk about what this flask represents and, uh, and what, it, what it means for them to have oil in their flask. But notice what it says. For a time, there was seen no difference between them. So with the church that lives just before Christ's second coming, all have a knowledge of the scriptures. So I want you to notice what we're reading here in Christ's object lessons. For a time, we see that the church, there is no difference between the foolish or the wise. They all are anticipating and waiting for the second coming of Jesus. They all have a knowledge of the scriptures. Notice, all have heard of the message of Christ's near approach and confidently expect his appearing. And when they heard, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, many are unready. They have no oil in their vessels with their lamps. They are destitute of what? Of the Holy Spirit. So understand what we just read here. The two classes of individuals that will be living right before Jesus comes is represented by the church. That is, five, half of the church will be wise, the other half will be foolish. Now, they all had oil, they all had a knowledge of the truth, they all had the word of God, they all were anticipating Christ's second coming, but five of them, the foolish church, decided not to put oil in their flask. And when the cry came out, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go out to meet him, they, the, the, we see from uh, Christ's object lessons that many were unready. Why? Because they had no oil in their vessels. And what is that representative of? They were destitute of the Holy Spirit. And so I want you to notice what Sons of Daughters, page 118 states. All had lamps, meaning they had an outward semblance of religion. But only five of them uh, out of the ten had the inward piety. Five of them were wanting in the oil of grace. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit, was not abiding where? In their hearts. So understand, they all had lamps with oil. All were studying the word of God and asking the Holy Spirit to guide them, but only five had invited the Holy Spirit into the life, which represents the vessel as described in the previous verse. And so this is why we see that Paul states in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. 
So, brothers and sisters, it's not just a professing of professing that we know Jesus. It's not just having a knowledge of Jesus. It's not just coming to saying, yep, I understand the 28 fundamentals. It's none of those things. What indicates whether or not we are of Christ is when we have the spirit of Jesus in our lives. For we see if any man has not the spirit of Christ, if no man has not the Holy Spirit in their lives, God says they are not mine. And so we see that the testimonies to the church, volume one, page 417, it says, here is the greatest deception that can affect the human mind. These persons believe that they are right when they are all wrong. We just, re we just studied that in our previous uh, lecture that we see that the rich young ruler and, the, uh, and uh, Nicodemus, they were both, they both thought themselves greater than what they were. And so Jesus had to say, no, you're not going down a right path. You're going up down a path that's going to lead you to destruction. And here is the greatest deception that affects you and I. We believe that we're right when in reality we're all wrong. They are found wanting when it is forever too late to have their wants supplied. And so, brothers and sisters, we see that this is one of the greatest deceptions that Satan has placed upon the God's last day church is that, that, that we believe in our hearts and our minds that we're going down a path that is leading us to the, to the gates everlasting, but in reality is leading down us to a, a path that leads us to destruction. I want you to notice what Christ's Object Lessons states about commentary, uh, Christ's Object Lessons, page 411, as it gives commentary to the parable of the foolish virgins. It says, the class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. Notice what it continues to say. They have a regard for the truth. They have advocated the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth, but they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. They have not fallen upon the rock, Christ Jesus, and permitted their own nature to be broken up. So understand what we just read. These virgins are not hypocrites. The foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They love the truth. They understand the three angels message. They understand the sanctuary. They believe in the health message. They understand all of the doctrines of the Bible. They even advocate the truth. They believe in what the message is being preached. They love uh, Amazing Discoveries television. They love hearing the messages. They're even attracted to those who believe in the truth. They go to church every week. They go to Bible studies to discuss more of the understanding of, uh, of the truth that they're attracted to. They all understand and love the truth. They advocate it. They're attracted to it. They have a regard for it. But notice what makes them foolish is that they do not allow the Holy Spirit to enter into their hearts and break up their old carnal nature. They never understood the love of Jesus. They never fell on the rock, Jesus Christ. Notice how the uh, statement concludes. The spirit works upon man's heart according to his desire and consent in planting in him a new nature. But the class represented by the foolish virgins have been content with what type of work? A superficial work. They do not know God. They have not studied his character. They have not held communion with him. Therefore, they do not know how to trust, how to look, and how to live. Oh, brothers and sisters, could it be that you and I could be a foolish virgins here today? We see that the spirit of God, if it's not working in our hearts, if it's not breaking up our old carnal nature, we see that at the end of the day, what you and I are ultimately accomplishing is a superficial work. And the reason why we're doing a superficial work is because we do not know God. And why is it that we do not know God? Because we have not studied his character. We have not held communion with him. And we do not know how to really trust in God, how to look at him and how to live. Love is so essential in our Christian walk, brothers and sisters. And so God doesn't really care about how much knowledge you know. He wants to know, do you know him personally? And so we see in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of what? Of death. You see, we may be thinking we're going down the right way. Well, I go to the church on the right day. I eat the right way. I dress the right way. I watch the right things. I do all of these right things. But at the end of the day, could it be that we have a knowledge of who God is, but lack the experience thereof? We see that Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says, it may seem right to you, but at the end of the day, it's a way of death. I want you to notice what testimony to the church or testimony to ministers, page 233 states. Now is the time to entreat that soul shall not only hear the word of God, but without delay, secure oil in their vessels with their lamps. So we see 
Now is the time that you and I must possess oil in our vessels. But notice what the oil represents. We know that the oil represents the Holy Spirit. But when I read this, this was a game changer. Are you ready for it? <laughs> Are you sure? Notice what the oil represents. The oil is the righteousness of Christ. It represents character and character is not transferable. Whoo! Now it makes sense. When we read Matthew chapter 25, when the wise virgins are telling, we cannot give you any of our oil, what essentially what they were saying is that we can't give you our characters. Our characters are not transferable. This is why the bridegroom says, depart from me, I do not know you, because the foolish virgins did not represent the character of Jesus. And so we see that the Holy Spirit, what is its, 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 its mission and its essential goal is to allow us to break up our old carnal nature and allow our nature to be represented, uh, one that represents the character of Jesus. So we see that the oil is the righteousness of Christ. It represents character. Character is not transferable. No man can secure it for another. Each must obtain for himself a character purified from every stain of sin. So, brothers and sisters, it's not your mommy and daddy's religion. It's not your pastor's religion. It's not your elder's religion. You must come to a personal relationship with Jesus because at the end of the day, if we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to do its work, if we're not surrendering to what the Holy Spirit is telling us to surrender, then, brothers and sisters, at the end of the day, we're going to, be, we're going to fall into the category of the foolish virgins. We must understand the importance of the Holy Spirit and invite it into our lives so that way we can ultimately have victory over sin and ultimately reflect the lovely image of Jesus Christ. This is why we see in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 11, the English Standard Version states, Depart, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing, go out from the midst of her, purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. So we see, remember that the vessels, that, that, that was essential for the oil to, that the oil needed to be inside the vessels, we see that the vessels is no other than you and I. And we're seeing in Isaiah 52 verse 11, touch no unclean thing. In other words, do not fall into sin, continue to avoid sin and purify yourselves, those who bear the vessels of the Lord. And so this is why Ellen White states that all heaven is waiting for channels through which can be poured the holy oil to be a what? to be a joy and a blessing to human hearts. If all were willing to receive, all would become filled with his spirit. All of heaven, brothers and sisters, is waiting to pour out the channels of blessings upon you and I. They want, God is willing and able to pour out his Holy Spirit to be a joy, to be a blessing in our hearts. But the condition is if we're willing to receive. If we would become filled with the Holy Spirit. But brothers and sisters, the Bible says we receive not for we ask not. And the reason why we do not ask is because we really don't understand the importance of the Holy Spirit. And the reason why we don't understand the importance is because in reality, we don't know who God is. We don't know his love for us. We have not fallen upon the rock, Jesus Christ, to break up our own nature, to allow our hearts to be drawn to him and allow his love to transform us completely. And so we see, brothers and sisters, that as we move forward, Christ Object Lessons, page 419 says that the religion of Christ means more than the forgiveness of sin. It means taking away our sins and filling the vacuum with the graces of the Holy Spirit. You see, many uh, people are preaching a half-hearted gospel. They said, well, come to the cross. God, Christ will forgive us for our sins, which is true. We studied that in our last presentation, that Jesus is willing to forgive us from all of our sins, to cleanse us from all of our righteousness. But when we are drawn to the cross, we see that not only Christ forgives us, but he wants to take away the sins in our lives and, in, and, and, and replace it with his Holy Spirit. And so we see that it continues in Christ Object Lessons, page 414. It says, by implanting in their hearts the principle of his word. Notice what happens. By implanting in their hearts the principle of his word, the Holy Spirit develops in men the attributes of God. The light of his glory, which is what? His character is to shine forth in his followers. So notice what it says here in Christ's Object Lessons. By implanting the principles of the Holy Spirit, we ultimately develop the character of God to shine forth to those who are around us. And thus, by glorifying God, we are able to lighten the path of the bridegroom's home to the city of God, to the marriage of the supper of the Lamb. 
And so what we're seeing that God ultimately wants us to be drawn by his love to look at the cross, not only to allow us to, for, uh, to, allow us to forget, receive forgiveness, but in order for us to, so that the cross can take away our sins and, and replace it with the Holy Spirit. And as we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, then we are able to glorify God. And how are we able to glorify God? By reflecting his character of love. And as we reflect the character of his love, then we are able to lighten the path to the bridegroom's home. And then we can allow people to come to the Supper of the Lamb. And so what is the Supper of the Lamb? Well, this is another story that Jesus uh, referred to in Matthew chapter 22 as we uh, talk about what the Holy Spirit is willing and able to do. This is a parable that Jesus speaks on about the parable of the wedding feast. And so what we're going to take a look at is in verse 2 and then verses 11 through 14. Notice what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 22 beginning in verse 2. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. Now let's jump to verse 11. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have a wedding garment. And so he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And verse 14, I'm sorry, verse 13. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into utter darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I want you to notice verse 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. You see, Jesus is talking about this wedding feast. And as he's inviting people to his son's wedding, he says, I want you to provide these special garments in order for them to be able to have access to this special feast. And so as the feast began, there was a man who did not have the right robe or the right clothing on. And we see that ultimately the question was asked, how did he get into the wedding feast? The man was speechless because he realized that his garments weren't like the garments of everyone else. And then the, the, the command was sent that you should bind them hand and foot, casting them out. But I want you to notice verse 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. We're going to talk about that here in a bit, but I want you to notice. Notice as we review quickly, there was a wedding garment that needed to be had. And this man did not have a wedding garment. And when he was called out on it, he was speechless. And then we see at the end of the parable that many are called, but few are chosen. I want you to notice what Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 390 states. Calling and justification are one and of the same thing, are not one and the same thing. Calling is the drawing of the sinner to Christ, and it is a work brought out by the Holy Spirit upon the heart, convicting of sin and inviting to repentance. So understand, calling and justification are not the same thing. You see, many are called to come to Jesus to confess their sins so that Christ can forgive them and empower them with the Holy Spirit. But many are called to come to repentance. Many are called to give their hearts to Jesus, but very few actually surrender their hearts to Jesus to allow the Holy Spirit to come upon their hearts to convict them of sin and ultimately lead them to repentance. And so we see that, uh, that the, ultimately the parable, according to uh, Christ's Object Lessons, page 307, it says that the parable of the wedding garment opens before us a lesson of the highest consequence. Notice what the marriage represents. It says, by the marriage is representing the union of humanity with divinity. The wedding garment represents the character all must possess who shall be accounted fit for the wedding. So understand what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 22. The parable of the wedding garment opens to us if, that if, we, if you and I do not possess the right garments that you and I cannot enter to the marriage feast. We cannot enter into heaven. What the marriage represents is the union of humanity and divinity. Our carnal nature with the power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And the wedding garment, the garment that you and I must possess in order for us to enter into the wedding or into heaven, is the character that must be, reprodu must be reproduced as we allow the Holy Spirit to do the work in our hearts. And notice what the statement states. It concludes by saying, all must possess who shall be a kind of fit guest for the wedding. You see, I've always heard this saying, and even I've, you may have said it, I've said it multiple times, that my desire is to, to get into heaven. But did you know that that's not God's desire? God's desire isn't for us to get into heaven. Did you know that? 
You're probably thinking to yourself, well, I'm about to cut this DVD off right now. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to watch something else. No, no, no. What, hear, hear what I'm saying. God's main goal isn't to get us into heaven. He wants to fit us into heaven. Let me give you an example. Um, before I gave my heart to Jesus, I was very influenced by rap and hip hop in the, in the hip hop culture. So, you know, so before I gave my heart to Jesus, I was known for wearing my baggy jeans, my my fitted caps and my uh, my big jackets. And, and it seemed like I used to walk with a limp. Right. It seemed like I always had a cramp in my in my leg or something. And, and anytime I spoke, I spoke with like, uh, 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 I always cut my words short, you know, like I always talk very slow, you know what I'm saying? You know, I always talked, I never talked English. I talked Ebonics. I, my, my first language is Ebonics. My second is English. But I remember going to, uh, 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 I was invited to a friend of mine. He invited me to a country club called Cowboys. And um, he loved country music and they was going to go line dancing. And I thought to myself, oh, why not? Let me try something new. And so we went out, and, and, and so as I go to the place, uh, to, this, to this club, I saw a whole lot of tight jeans, big belt buckles, and pointed shoes, and big old caps, big old hats. And I thought to myself, man, this is definitely not the place I need to be right now. And I was, as, as I was in line, right, I needed proper identification and the right amount of money in order for me to get in. And so I'm in, I'm in line, everyone's kind of looking at me funny, I'm looking at everyone else funny, and I get into the club, but I want you to notice, what I'm about to say. I got into the club, but I didn't fit into the club. Do you notice the difference? You see, everyone there looked a specific way. I looked different from everyone else. You see, God doesn't want us to get into heaven. He wants to prepare us here on earth to fit us into heaven. He wants our characters to reflect the character of his son, Jesus, so that way we are prepared to enter into heaven and it can be a second place, a second home to us. It's as if we never left. Uh, heaven in the first place. And so this is why Christ's Lesson, page 310 states the following. To the church it is given that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, not having spots or wrinkle or any such thing. The fine linen, says the scripture, is the righteousness of the saints. So what is the righteousness of the saints? It is the righteousness of Christ, his own unblemished character that through faith is imparted to all who receive him as their personal savior. So we see that Christ's great desire is for his church, the church is made up of the people, to ultimately be arrayed in fine linen, which is the righteousness of the saints, which in reality is the righteousness of Christ. To have an unblemished character that is filled with his love, that is able to demonstrate the fruits of his spirit. And so how do we get this imparted character, which is the righteousness of the saints? Notice what it says in the following quotation in Christ's Object Lessons, page 312. By his perfect obedience, he made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. Amen? And so we see when we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart and the will is merged in his will. So notice what we're reading here. By his perfect obedience, by Christ's perfect obedience, he made it possible for every human being on planet Earth, including you and I, to be able to obey the commandments of God. But the condition is that we must first submit to Christ. And once we submit, then our hearts is aligned with Christ's heart. And then his will, his desire becomes our desires. You see, many do not want to believe this. They believe that the wedding garment is just a covering that Christ gives to us when he comes. But brothers and sisters, we see that this is a deception. The garment is the character which Christ works in us. Notice how the statement concludes. It says, the mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life. This is what it means to be clothed with the righteous in the garment of his righteousness. So we see that God's great desire is for us not to be covered in our sins, but he wants to transform us through his love in our hearts that outwardly we are representing his character. Does that make sense? The mind, brothers and sisters, when we submit to Jesus, will be his mind. The thoughts that Jesus possesses will be our thoughts. Everything that he desires for us, we would want desire for us as well. This is what it means to be covered by the garment of his righteousness. Brothers and sisters, this is what Christianity is all about. It's not just about forgiveness, but the power to live a life like a Christ-like life. Amen? I want you to notice what uh, Desire of Ages, uh, page 556 states that the righteousness of Christ is not a cloak to cover unconfessed and unforsaken sin. It is a principle of life that transforms the character. And what does it do? It controls the conduct, 
Holiness, oh, I love the simplicity here. Holiness is wholeness for God. It is the entire surrender of the heart and life to the indwelling of the principles of heaven. And so we see that the righteousness of Christ is not a covering to cover unforsaken sin or unconfessed sins, but brothers and sisters, it is a principle that you and I live in that, that allows us to live according to God's word that transforms our character and controls the way that we act. You see, being holy is simply being whole in Jesus Christ. This is why when we see Jesus says, be ye holy or be perfect as my heavenly father in heaven is perfect, what that word perfection simply means is being complete, being whole in Jesus. It's allowing our whole life, our whole hearts to be surrendered to the only one who ever loved us and ever cared. It's by living by the principles of heaven. And so you see, brothers and sisters, when we see this picture, this is not an accurate right, description of what Christ wants to do for us. He doesn't want to cover us in our sins. What he wants to do is to remove our old cloaks and put on new cloaks for us. This is why Zechariah chapter 3 verse 4 says, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sins and I will put on fine garments on you. Christ wants to take, a, take off our old garments and put on new ones. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. And that's what I'm willing to accept. How about you? I want you to notice what Testimony to the Church, Volume 5, page 310 states. Even your thoughts, brothers and sisters, must be brought into subjection to the will of God and your feelings under the control of reason and religion. Your imagination was not given to you to be allowed to run riot and to have its own way without any effort at restraint or discipline. If the thoughts are wrong, the feelings will be wrong. And the thoughts and notice and the feelings combined make up the moral character. Woo, listen to me. How often do we allow our thoughts to wander? How often do we sit there and we base our decision based on feelings and emotions? Notice that there is a progression that happens if our thoughts are wrong. If we have a wrong conception of God, if we have a misconception of who Jesus is, right? If the thoughts are wrong, then ultimately our feelings will be wrong. And our thoughts that we possess and our feelings combined make up our ultimately how we act towards everyone and how we respond and makes up our character. So I want you to understand how many times do we sit there and we commit a sin, a sin that we've asked God to forgive us over and over again, time and time again. We come and we fall on our knees and we say, Lord, forgive me. I'm tired of committing this sin. I'm tired of, of, being, uh, of being overcome by this. I want victory. But that thought comes into our minds. Jesus can't forgive you. How many times have you prayed this prayer? Your prayer is not sincere. And we allow those thoughts to, to occupy our mind that ultimately our feelings is, as we come to Christ, our feelings are that that Christ will not forgive me. Though the Bible says, if you confess, he is willing and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How many times do we fall on our knees and we say, Lord, Forgive me for my sin. Lord, I ask that you may forgive me. And we get up from our prayer and we feel as if we're not forgiven. Brothers and sisters, this is a deception of Satan himself to allow us to dictate whether or not God can forgive us based on our feelings. This is why our thoughts must be Christ's thoughts. Our feelings won't be wrong if we have the right mind of Christ because once we have the right understanding of Jesus and his thoughts for us and our feelings combined, then we can have the right moral character that is necessary for us to represent Jesus. Does that make sense? And so we see that if our thoughts are wrong, so will our thoughts. And if our thoughts and feelings are wrong, then that ultimately makes up our moral character. And brothers and sisters, Christ wants, us to, wants to give us good thoughts. He wants to give us great feelings so that way we can represent him as we continue on our Christian journey. So I want you to notice Christ's Lessons, page 330. More perfection is required of all. That is a standard. That's what Christ wants from you and I. But never should we lower the standard of righteousness in order to accommodate inherited and cultivated tendencies to wrongdoing. We need to understand that imperfection of character is what? It's sin. You see, the standard that God has, uh, that has raised for you and I to abide by is one that we must have moral perfection. But you see, many, of, many preachers, many churches, many believers have lowered the standard of righteousness because we do not truly believe that we can have victory. But we see that Christ wants to give us victory. 
This was a problem of the rich young ruler. They, they compared themselves to everyone else, thinking, well, as long as I'm better than this person, I'm okay. But brothers and sisters, we never live our life according to man's standard. We live our lives according to God's standards. Amen? We should never lower the standard to, in, 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 to, to accommodate our lifestyle. Christ has said, this is the standard. I want you to live it. But you and I cannot do it on ourselves. We must and we need the power of the Holy Spirit and his righteousness to do it. And so we see that it continues in Christ's Office of page 317. Men may now excuse their defects of character, but in that day, they will offer no excuse. Oh, man, listen, I've, I've, I can give you a thousand reasons why I do what I do. Oh, well, you know, I, I was tempted. You know, this, this lady gave me the, the eye, and so I decided to follow my inclination and what my heart desired for me to do, right? We, oh, the reason why I'm upset is because uh, uh, somebody crossed me and, and they said the wrong thing, so I had to show them that I ain't no punk, right? So, so, so we ultimately make excuses for our defective characters, but brothers and sisters, on that day when Jesus comes, there will be offered no excuse, no viable excuse. And so the question is, what are the spots and defects of character? Since the thoughts and the feelings combined make up the moral character, defects must be wrong thoughts and wrong feelings or even wrong attitudes. So how could God, notice, will allow us to enter into heaven with hearts having resentment, having bitterness, having envying, jealousy, hatred, evil surmising, or any other defects of character? The character will not be changed when Jesus comes. It must be changed before he comes. Amen? And so, brothers and sisters, Christ wants to fit us into heaven. He doesn't want to get, he doesn't want to get us into heaven. As he fits us, then we get to get in. Amen? So this is why we see Adventist Home states the following. Many are deceiving themselves by thinking that the character will be transformed at the coming of Christ, but there will be no conversion of heart at his appearing. Our defects of character must be repented of, and through the grace of Christ, we must overcome them while probation shall last. So, brothers and sisters, this is what Christ wants to do in you and I before he comes. But I'm so grateful for the promises of the Bible. How about you? Because I want you to notice what 1 John chapter 7, uh, verse 1, verse 7 and 9 states. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So any resentment, any bitterness, any envying, any, any evil surmising that you may have, Christ says if you confess it, he is willing to forgive you, to cleanse you, and to empower you to live a holy and beautiful life. Amen? Ephesians chapter 5 tells us this, the, the desire of what that Christ wants for you and I, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having what? Spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by what? Through his what? Through his word. Christ wants to cleanse us. He wants to regenerate us. He wants to sanctify us. He wants to cleanse us. How? Through his word, through the empowerment of his Holy Spirit. This is, the, this is, this is what Christ desires for his church. And so we see the signs of the time states the following. It is only the blessed and holy who will be ready for the first resurrection. For when Christ comes, notice what it states, he will not change the character. The word of God declares that we must be found, what? Blameless without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And so this is what, we, what Christ is expecting his followers and believers to, to be engaged in then to allowing the Holy Spirit to work in their hearts so that where there'll be no spot or wrinkle or any such thing when he returns. I want you to notice what Selected Messages Volume 1 states. It is a spiritual and moral character that is of value in the sight of heaven and that will survive the grave and be made glorious with immortality for the endless ages of eternity. You see, God doesn't care about how much knowledge you have. He wants to know, have you been living right? Have you been living according to my word? Have you lived up to the, to the standard that I have placed before you? And understand that you cannot do it within yourself. You must ask of my power, my spirit, to come into you, and I will empower you to do so. We see that the spiritual and moral character is what is of value to Jesus and all of heaven. This is what it will ultimately allow us to survive the great time that is before us. And brothers and sisters, this is when we see that those who died in Christ will come up and will be made glorious. And we see that Christ is going to give us then at that point into immortality. He will give us a new, uh, a, new, um, a new body 
but he will not give us a new character. Our characters must be developed here and now. This is why 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14 says, Be diligent that we may be found of him in peace without spot and what? Blameless. That the grace of Christ must be woven into every phase of what? Character. Christ wants his love, his grace to be woven into every aspect of our lives. That we may possess the character of Jesus Christ. Notice what Acts of the Apostles, page 478 states. In his efforts to reach God's ideal for him, the Christian is to despair of nothing, moral and spiritual perfection, through the grace and power of Christ, is promised to some. <laughs> the promise says it's promised to all. Jesus is the source of power, the fountain of life at every step. Notice, we touch his living power. So what is God's ideal? Is for us not to be despair of anything. That understand that if we submit to Jesus, if we allow his spirit to work in us, and as we surrender our hearts to him, that we are able to re uh, uh, reach and achieve moral and spiritual perfection. But we can only receive it, brothers and sisters, through the grace and the power of Christ. And this is promised to all. Jesus is the source. He is the fountain of life. He gives the power. And as I surrender to him, brothers and sisters, it says at every step we touch his living power. That is what Christ wants you and I to experience. So many of us are struggling in our experience thinking that this is the life that we must live. We get tempted, we fall into sin, we ask God to forgive us. But what Christ wants us to experience is true victory. And the only way that you and I can experience it is through understanding who he is by allowing his love to dwell in our hearts and allowing the spirit to do the work that is desiring it to do. And brothers and sisters, as we conclude, the only way that you and I can rest assured that everything is going to turn out all right is if we understand that we have a loving Savior in heaven that is interceding for us, for, uh, for you and I. You see, we see that the Apostle John states, I write these things that you may sin not. But if you sin, if you do fall into sin, understand you have an advocate with the Father in heaven. Oh, Jesus loves you. Oh, he doesn't want you to struggle anymore with those sins. He wants you to let go of them. He wants you to have victory in him. Ask for his spirit. He says, as, you, as freely as you ask, I'm willing to give. But at some point, brothers and sisters, if you felt like you left whole, let go of the hand of God, he says, listen, I want you to get back up. The book of Solomon says that a righteous man uh, uh, stands up seven times. Why is a man righteous? It's because he continues to get back up. You see, brothers and sisters, this is what Christ wants for you and I to, to receive. It's the power of the Holy Spirit to live a life that is pleasing in all of heaven and all of the earth. I don't know about you, but I want that power. I don't know about you, but I, I'm craving and desiring for something more than what I'm experiencing. How about you? You see, what we're going to take a look at in our third presentation is one more example of people who thought they were true followers of Jesus, but discovered that they were indeed deceived. So we're going to talk about the Laodicean church in our next presentation. But understand, brothers and sisters, the importance of the essential oil that is needed for you and I. Christ wants us to ask for the Spirit of God so that way we can be empowered by His love, by His Spirit, so that the things that so easily, the sins that so easily besets us, the things that are causes us to stumble and to fall, we can have victory in our lives today. Amen? So as we conclude, understand that Jesus loves you, He's willing to be there for you, and that if you fall, that He is there interceding on your behalf. Let us pray as we conclude. Lord God, we just want to thank you again for your love, for your grace, and for your mercy. And Father, we just thank you so much for the parable of understanding the foolish virgins and the essential oil that you're willing to give to those who ask. We need an outpouring of your Holy Spirit in our lives, not only to forgive us for our sins, but the Lord, that we may have power to have victory over them. Lord, forgive us for our envy, for, for our envious ways. Forgive us for our, 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 our desires to be ahead of everyone else for our selfishness and our pride. Lord, we ask that you may take these things away and infuse us with your spirit and with your love that we may be a shining light to others. Lord, prepare us for that great day when you will return and take your children home to be with you for all of heaven. Lord, we thank you so much for your, your love and sending your son down here, on the, uh, down here to earth to die for our sins, but most importantly for the work that he's doing in heaven, interceding on the behalf of his children, of your children. We love you, we thank you, for we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Hi.
Hi YouTube, I'm Walter Feit from Amazing Discoveries. If you'd like to learn more or you would like to subscribe, then click visit our webpage, donate, share, and we would like to hear from you.